Good morning. This is Jimmy. It's Thursday morning. And we got to hurry again this morning because I got up a little late. I was tired. And uh, we have many things to do today. So we got to get our lesson done. And since we're at the end of Joel, it may well be that, that this is the, the last day that we'll be in Joel. I'm still praying about what to start next. I'll go back to the New Testament. Uh, if God doesn't show me where to go next and I don't have a, a burden one way or the other, well, then I will probably do a what I call a, a, a parenthetical, a parenthesis tomorrow, something that's been on my mind a while and not especially a book study. We'll just see what happens because God is good and he's given me, he's given me the, uh, the tenacity to keep doing this. Good morning, Susie in Lahore, Pakistan. Now, I just want to read chapter 3 because we will finish this today of Joel. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel. This is the preamble to the, to the, uh, the battle of Armageddon and that's what this chapters about the calling together of the armies of the Antichrist to face the Lord and his Christ um, at the battle of Armageddon, then the battle itself, and then the aftermath, which is the kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. Remember, that's the outline here. I will also bring, I also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. The biggest sin you can commit before God among the nations is to divide the land of Israel, which they constantly do. All who hate God love death. And that is why we have the situation in the Middle East is because you have people there who are actually the Philistines. Uh, they call them Palestinians. Uh, the ones who live in Gaza are Egyptian. The ones who live in the Golan Heights are Syrian. The ones who live in the West Bank are Jordanians. There are no Palestinians. They're Philistines living in the land of the Philistines, the coast of the sea people, and those people are dead. But their wickedness and evil has been resurrected in these ungodly, hateful people. And uh, they have determined to kill every Jew on the earth. So don't let what you see on the news fool you. The name Palestinian was given to them by the Romans because they hated the Jews and they knew that the Philistines were the Jews' historic enemy. So always... Remember this, the greatest sin a nation can do is to take, encroach upon, or divide the land of Israel. Because God says it's my land. I'm going to judge everybody who parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Palestine, Philistine, Philistia? Will ye render me a recompense? Will ye recompense me swiftly and speedily? Will I return your recompense upon your head? Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. And children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians, that you might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off. For the Lord hath spoken it. Why? Because they parted God's land. 
Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men, let all men of war draw near, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. And gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause my mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow. For their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. When? Then. When God rules in his holy mountain. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. And there shall be no strangers pass through her anymore. And it shall come to pass in that day that the, the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. The Lord dwelleth in Zion. The Lord dwelled in Zion then. The Lord dwelled in Zion when he gave it to Abraham. The Lord dwelled in Zion when the people of Israel out of the captivity of Egypt came out of the wilderness and entered into the promised land. But God dwelt in Zion when Caleb took Mount Hebron, when David and Joab took Jerusalem away from the Jebusites, God dwelled in Zion today. Today, as I speak on September 19th, 2024, the Lord dwells in Zion. That will never change. Israel will not lose. We'll go through the great tribulation. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. More than half the people on earth will be killed but the kingdom will be established and there will be no more rebellion. There will be no more. The Lord dwelleth in Zion. Now, what will that look like? Well, we look to Revelation 20 for the, for a good baseline description. And then I'm going to give you some other stuff. We've read this before, but it's been a while. This is after just immediately following the Battle of Armageddon. Chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven immediately after the Battle of Armageddon where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown into the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. They've been thrown in alive. Good morning, Brother Haroon. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Chris and or Julie. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent 
which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, that he should not deceive the nations, that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, I've explained this when we studied this before. The reason he must be loosed is to prove to humans that the sin is in us. For a thousand years, they'll live in the presence of God. King Jesus will sit on the throne. And uh, they'll seek, be able to see King Jesus. Righteousness will go forth from Mount Zion. The law will go into all the world. The entire world will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. From the capital of Mount Zion. And so there will be no sin in the world. You see, we break it down to the world and the flesh and the devil. There'll be no, no sin in the world. And when there is, Jesus puts a quietus on it real quick. Because there will be some rebellion, because there will still be death. But that's the purpose of the kingdom to bring all things into submission. Uh, one of the purposes of the kingdom. The other is to restore it like it was at Eden in the beginning. This world, not another. But then later there will be a new heavens and a new earth, as I explained. Those are detailed in chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. Peter also talks about it. They won't be tempted by the world because it will be ruled by Jesus and any rebellion will be dealt with like that it wasn't a very loud snap hmm that my snapper is dry this morning it doesn't doesn't seem to go well you know it's just like the rest of me my snapper's wearing out it used to be a lot louder it was like a kapow Everything dies, beloved. The clock winds down. It's just how it is. The world will not tempt anyone during the millennial kingdom because Jesus is king and he's ruling on the earth and we're ruling with him as kings and priests. And the world can't, won't be tempted by the devil. Because the devil's going to be in a bottomless pit for this thousand years, locked down tight. He can't tempt anybody. So all that leaves is the flesh. Satan is loose for a season to prove to mankind that even in a perfect environment, even without the influence of Satan, that we will still sin. Because the original sin of Adam and Eve from the fall is in our flesh and cannot be expiated. Except by being glorified and washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, you see. And to have a glorified body that is free from temptation. The sin is in ourselves. It's Shakespeare phrased it like this and they were talking about the fortune tellers and was it Hamlet is the default it's in the play Hamlet I think I can't remember they all run together at my age I read them all at one time daddy had a collected works of Shakespeare that was like about that thick I read all those plays, all the sonnets. I read it all. But anyway, the line goes like this. The, our fault, the, the fault lieth not in the stars, but in ourselves. And that is exactly what the Bible teaches. The sin is in us. And it doesn't take much for us to rebel against God. And that is what the thousand year reign proves, especially the part of it where Satan is loosed at the end for a little season. Well, let's look at the kingdom while for a thousand years while Satan is bound and while 
Jesus is king on the throne of his servant, of his father, David, and his servant, David. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And for the word of God, in which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again. Good morning, Sam. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Now this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him how long? A thousand years. And when the thousand years, how long? A thousand years. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is what we're praying for right now. This kingdom of God on earth that will reign for a thousand years. And when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison to prove that we don't need temptation, to prove that the fault is in ourselves. We can sin without the leading of Satan because we are sinners. There's only two kinds of people in the whole world. There's lost sinners and saved sinners. Which one are you? And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sound of the sand of the sea. A thousand years of peace, a thousand years of perfection, a thousand years of the restored planet, a thousand years of the rule of King Jesus, when all is justice. And one word from Satan awakens the sin in the humans who remain, multitudes, multitudes of them. And they join him. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, which is Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. There wasn't even a battle this time. It was just... Kaboom. There wasn't nothing left to bury either. It devoured them, the fire did. Think about the fire that came down upon Elijah's sacrifice on Mount Carmel. It lapped up the sacrifice, the animal, the blood. It lapped up the rocks. It lapped up the fire. It lapped up the water. It lapped up everything and the dust. There wasn't anything left wasn't anything left of the sacrifice. It's the way it'll be at the end, at the second battle, the second war of Gog and Magog, which Satan will lead himself and not, not the armies of the Antichrist or the armies of any other, any other predecessor to the Antichrist. God will just devour them with this fire that comes out of heaven. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, not were. They were thrown in there a thousand years before on the day of Christ's victory at the battle of Armageddon. For a thousand years, they have been alive in, in torment, being tortured, punished, in the lake of fire, Gehenna, hell. It's a lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. The beast and the false prophet that deceived the whole world are there. And Satan is thrown in there where they are at a thousand years after they were thrown in the beast and the false prophet. They're still alive and being tortured. That's hell. There's no end to hell. The fire will not burn out. It says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. There's no end to hell. 
you don't get out. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Back to verse 10, the fire. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are not were were, they're still there a thousand years later they'll be there ten thousand times ten thousand years later they'll never get out where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever that's what's in store for him When God rules on the earth during the kingdom of Jesus. I'm going to read you a little bit from Isaiah chapter 65. Talks about what it's going to be like. in the millennium during the thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth this describes a time when Jesus will reign on the earth. We see him taking charge in 63 after the battle of Armageddon. When he comes out of Edom, Basra, with his garments splashed in blood. And it goes through the people crying for him to be their king. It goes from the people accepting the king. When God says the famous words in chapter 65, quoted by Paul, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good. After their own thoughts, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifices in the gardens and burneth incense upon the altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near me, for I am holier than thou. This is the state of the unsaved man. But God changes that. And he says, there's new wine in the cluster. Destroy it not. 
This is the beginning of the kingdom. We get specific in verse 8 of chapter 65 of Isaiah. Good morning, Charlie. Thus saith the Lord, verse 8, a new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. Remember, part you're not supposed to depart to part my land. You're not supposed to divide my land, God says. And I will bring forth a seed. Mine elect shall inherit it, my servants shall dwell there, and Sharon shall be a field of flocks. In the valley of Achor, a place for herds to lie down in, for my people have sought me. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, that furnish the drink offering unto that number. So we support the world and the things of the world. And it's against us because it's against God. And we should always be against it. Therefore, I will number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, ye did not answer. You have no excuse for not being saved. Get saved today. He's calling. Jesus is tenderly calling you home. Calling today. Calling today. When I spake, ye did not hear. Hear today. Now is the accepted time. But you did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart. Ye shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. A people that sought not after me found me. That is the mystery of the church. That is the mystery of the Gentiles. That believe in the God of the Jews. Revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made to buy our way out of hell that he paid for with his body and his blood on Mount Calvary. And that he rose the third day to prove that he is the son of the living God and exists now to intercede with us for the for us with the Father who plans to return some glorious day. Come, Lord Jesus. Ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. None, nothing else shall we be blessed, and no one else shall we be blessed. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, because they are hid from mine eyes. You were a people who didn't seek me. That's fine. Seek me now. You were a people who didn't know me. That's fine. Know me now. I was sought. This is a, he said that I was sought of them that were no people but have now become a people because they love me, because they chose to come to me by the blood of my only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God says, you didn't know me before, well, you know me now. Come to me now. How do we know him now? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Christ and him crucified, that's how we know him now. Because nobody but the Son of God can pay for the sins of the world. 
Nobody but the Son of God could rise from the dead and go into glory and reign in the throne of his Father right now. No one except the Son of God is coming again to reign on this earth, and he will sit in Israel on Mount Zion on the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. He will rule with a rod of iron. The law shall go forth from Mount Zion. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. Good morning, Amber. And the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. Behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing. There are not many people rejoicing in Jerusalem right now today, but they will. And by the name of the living God, we'll be with them in that day. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and join my people. And the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Right now, they're crying for the hostages. Right now, they're crying for the dead and the wounded. Right now, they're crying for how are they going to fight all these Arab armies that are surrounding them. All these heathens who are supplied by the great God-hater Iran. Death and destruction to all the foes of God. Death and hell, swallow them up. Anybody who raises their hand against the living Christ, let God deal with them. He says a while ago, remember, he said, I will put my recompense upon your own head. Whatever you pay me, I'm going to pay you. In Exodus, when he talks to Moses, trying to explain who he is, he says, he says, I bless those that bless me unto the third and the fourth generation. But the man who hates me, I will repay him to his face. We're seeing that play out in the world today. God is repaying the people who hate him to their face. The day before yesterday, he did it with pagers and blew up a whole bunch of his bold lot. 14, 15 dead, thousands wounded. Yesterday, he did it with walkie talkies. This is the hand of God through his people destroying the enemies of God. Don't ever doubt it. And don't say a word against it, or you'll suffer. You will suffer repercussions from the God of Israel. You speak against Israel, boy. You make sure you got your facts straight. And all the people you see on TV do not have their facts straight. You see, because they hate God, too. Everyone who hates Israel hates God. God says, all that hate me love death. And that's all there is in the Middle of East. Middle East, without the hand of God, that's all there is, is sin and death in the grave. And it comes quicker to some than others. I create Jerusalem a rejoicing in her people, a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her nor the voice of crying. There should be no more fence and infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. But a child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old should be accursed. Those who live in the Lord, if they died a hundred years old, people will say, well, he was just a child. There will be people alive at the judgment seat of Christ that I read to you in Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. There will be people alive to see that. That are alive at the beginning of the kingdom. 
because Eden will be restored. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them, and they shall not build and another inherit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect, the days of the tree are the same as the days of my people. We got sequoias out in California. They say they've been there for over 2,000 years. Same tree. As the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear because God will be with them. The word Emmanuel means God with you. One day, that was Jesus during the incarnation, but one day for a thousand years, it will be all the time. God will be with us all the time. Jesus will sit on the throne of David. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. This is the peace of the millennium. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Amazing. Amazing. In Zechariah, there's another passage or two. Oh, I know we have to go. I have me. I got to go to the doctor too. Let's look at Daniel real quick, just for a minute. Daniel has this vision of kingdoms, and then he sees a a final kingdom coming. And this is at the end of the tribulation when Christ comes to earth. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. And I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit. Whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as a burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him thousands thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the judgment was said and the books were opened and i beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke i be beheld even till the beast was slain remember the beast was taken and thrown into the lake of fire and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame as concerning the rest of the beasts, they, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. I wonder who that could be. He came with clouds of heaven. I wonder who that could be. And came to the Ancient of Days, the Father. And they brought the Son near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. In Zechariah, please. Bear with your teacher as he finds the spot. 
chapter 8 of Zechariah. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Good morning, Berta. I'm well. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. I was jealous, jealous for Zion with great jealousy. And I was jealous for her with a great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. And every man with his staff in his hand for very age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls. Playing in the streets together, see it as a kingdom of mortal men over restored Israel over the restored capital, not only of Israel, but of the world, Jerusalem, where King Jesus sits on the throne of his father, David. Remember where the lamb and the lion lay down together. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. You see, that's what it's going to look like. And among the people that are left, the people in the kingdom who enter mortal, he says this, verse 16 of chapter 8, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine in evil in your hearts against his neighbor and love no false oath for all these things I are things that I hate saith the Lord and the word of the Lord came unto me Zechariah saying thus saith the Lord of host the fast now this is during the millennial kingdom describing the blessings of the Lord and thus saith the Lord of hosts the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness, and cheerful feasts, therefore love the truth and peace. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet it shall come to pass that there shall come people and inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, let us go speedily, to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. You can't even get them to come to church now, but this is going to be different. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. Why in Jerusalem? Because that's where he's going to be. King Jesus. And to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, we'll go with you. For we have heard 
that God is with you. Oh my. Are you a Jew? Why, yes, I am. Are you returning to Jerusalem? Well, of course I am. My business here is done. I've been in the I've been in the garment business for the last 472 years. I'm just getting started. Are you going back to Jerusalem? Of course I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'm going there to worship the king. He's going to bless me for the things that I've done. I'm going to show him my wares. I'm going to show him my property. <coughs> I'm going to dress some of his servants. Remember what the proverb said? A man diligent in his business shall stand before kings. But one day, some people that are diligent will stand before King Jesus. And they say, you sure you're a Jew and you're going back to Jerusalem? Well, of course I am. And they say, well, we'll go with you. Because we know that the Lord your God is there. And we want you to bring us before the Lord your God. You know, you pray hard enough, that could happen right now. You work hard enough, that could happen right now. I'm old enough to remember when nobody got saved in church, unless maybe they was having a revival meeting and people would bring their lost friends. When I was a kid, people got saved at home. They got saved over the kitchen table. They got saved over the back fence. They got saved at work. They got saved in the grocery store. They got saved on the street. They got saved in the park. They got saved on a fishing trip. And then they didn't come to church to get saved. They came to church because they had been saved. And when God saves you, he calls you to church. He calls you to be a member of the church. He calls you to get in a church and work and don't quit. Ever. Well, Brother Harris, you're kind of hard. Well, God's hard. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the custom of some is. And all the more as you see that day approaching. What day? The rapture. Paul only knew two days, today and that day. And that day is the rapture. Let us go with you back to Jerusalem because we know that the Lord, he is God. And we want to know him just like you do. Take us with you. And I must assert that if we were living the kind of lives that Christ wants us to lead, that people would be taking a hold of our garment. They'd be pulling on our sleeve, and on, our, on our skirt or whatever, and saying, well, you know the Lord. Take me to the Lord. I want to know him too. Again, the line from Shakespeare, the fault is not in the stars, but in ourselves. Biblically, you would say the fault is not in the Lord, but in ourselves. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He left within us the tools to build his church to be his hands, to be his feet, to do the work that he wants done. But beloved, it's up to us whether we do it or not. Are people begging you to take you to see the king, take them to see the king? Are they begging you to go wherever you go because they know you know Jesus, they want to know Jesus too? I would like to, as we finalize Joel here, I would like to submit this. And it is a judgment not only of you good people who are watching, but of myself. If I was serving the Lord the way that I should, I got to believe that lost sinners would grab a hold of my arm and say, I don't know where you're going, but I want you to take me with you. Because apparently you know the Lord. It would be that obvious. 
is something to shoot for. I do know one thing. If we don't aim at it, we won't hit it. God bless you. I don't know why it won't turn off.